uh, that's the person I was waiting for to connect that I knew wanted to show. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, my name is Erin Good. I am currently chairing the ARENA Seminar Committee. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Andrea Richard. Uh, Andrea obtained her bachelor's degree in 2011 from Muskegon University. Sorry if I mispronounced that. <laughs> uh, she then got her MS and her PhD from Ohio University. Uh, after obtaining her PhD, she had her first postdoc at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory at Michigan State University, where she worked on the Beta Oslo method. And she is now currently a postdoctoral researcher at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where she works on the surrogate method. And uh, these are both gonna be really great as she's gonna get direct with us about some indirect neutron capture techniques today. So I ask that you just mute and we'll do questions at the end. And uh, with that, let's take it away, Andrea. All right, okay. Let's see. Can you see my slides okay? Yep, that looks great. Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, I'm really excited to talk to you today about um, getting direct about indirect neutron capture techniques. Uh, if you know me, you know I love a pun and so I couldn't really <laughs> help myself uh, in the title. So um, I was invited to give this seminar for the IRENA community to sort of go over the, a couple of different indirect techniques uh, for obtaining neutron capture cross sections and reaction rates for astrophysical processes. And so today I will uh, talk first very broadly, um, you know, some very general things about nuclear astrophysics and the, you know, uh, neutron capture processes that we're interested in constraining. And then I'll go into some more details about uh, two different indirect techniques uh, and some small parts about a third one. Um, and then I'm happy to take any questions at the end. And uh, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> So um, just to begin, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all sort of, um, you know, at the same starting point. And so this figure is what's called the chart of the nuclides. It's organized with increasing number of protons on the y-axis, increasing number of neutrons on the x-axis. This is a representation of all of the known isotopes um, that exist. Everything that's shown in a black square is a stable element, something that's coming directly from the periodic table. Um, and everything else that's, that's color coded in this olive green color or, or the other colors uh, is a radioactive isotope that we want to measure for, for different applications. And so as a community, we have a lot of open questions that we want to try to address uh, in nuclear science. But in particular, in nuclear astrophysics, I think we fit most into the first point, which is how did visible matter come into being and how did it evolve? And so I just want to give a, a brief overview of, of sort of like nuclear astrophysics in a nutshell, um, just so we sort of understand how this whole process works together, especially if you're maybe new in the nuclear astrophysics community. So astronomers uh, will go and, and measure these different astrophysical scenarios, like a neutron star merger or a carbon enhanced metal poor star. And from these observations, they can produce abundance plots like the one that's shown here. This is just abundance versus atomic number that tell us the different uh, amounts of a particular element in that astrophysical environment. In nuclear science, we wanna try to understand these observed abundances or these predicted abundances in the framework of things that we can measure or things that we can calculate um, if you're doing nuclear theory instead. And so these are things like masses, for example, how heavy the, the isotope is, uh, the half-life, how long it takes for half of the, the, you know, the isotope to decay, or how fast or how slow a particular reaction is, uh, which is what we'll talk about for the rest of the time in the context of neutron capture reactions. And once we combine these pieces of information, we can then use this to predict the elemental abundances in the universe for things like the R process, where we don't have uh, as much observational evidence. And so I kind of uh, painted this in a very linear way that we get observations, we do nuclear science, and then we get the abundances. But really this is more of a, a circle, I think, where we all feed into each other. So in nuclear science, we can ask observers, please measure this specific thing. Or you know, somebody who produces um, 
you know, predicted abundances says in nuclear science, can you please measure this so that we can better constrain our model? And so this is how all of these different things work together in the context of, of nuclear astrophysics. And I think this is something that Gina and now Irina has done a great job in making that connection for us. So if you look across the nuclear chart, yeah, you can see that there are quite a few different um, processes uh, for nuclear nucleosynthesis. And so I just wanted to give a very broad picture, but now we're gonna zoom in on, on the more neutron rich side and talk about those. And so for things that are lighter than iron, we know that they're, they're made in some sort of a fusion style process, whether it's the PP chain or stellar burning. But once we get to iron, this is no longer energetically favorable to do fusion. So instead we have to ask, what is the origin of the elements above iron? And we know that these are neutron capture processes on our, on our neutron rich side. And so these are things like the slow neutron capture process or the S process that happens very close to stability where a beta decay would occur before you're able to capture additional neutrons. And the neutron densities uh, for these types of environments are shown here. On the very exotic side, we have the R process, the rapid neutron capture process that would happen, for example, in a neutron star merger. This happens very far from stability where you're able to capture many neutrons before beta decaying back towards the stable isotopes. And this is a sort of typical R process neutron density. There's also in between these, the I process, which if you've heard me give a talk before, you've probably heard me talking about the I process. Um, the I process is the intermediate neutron capture process that happens somewhere in between these two. And so for each of these different processes, we wanna to try to ask the question, what are the nuclear data needs that we have for these processes? And really what we're asking in that context is what do we know now and what do we need to know or what do we need to measure so that we can know things better? And so if you look at half-lives, you can see that half-lives are, are fairly well constrained across the nuclear chart. At least there's been some measurement, um, you know, reaching out into like potential R process areas. Uh, the same thing can be said for masses. You can see that masses, uh, you know, are fairly well constrained, especially like, you know, five or six nucleons away from stability. Um, that's not to say that half-lives and masses aren't important to measure because they definitely are, especially if we can get precise values for these. Um, but just to highlight, you know, the difference between these two and a neutron capture rate, you can see that neutron capture rates have been measured uh, far less than these other two quantities. And the ones that have been measured are very close to stability. And so the reason for this is that, well, they're kind of hard to measure. And so ideally you'd wanna do a direct measurement where you impinge your neutron on your A minus one nucleus to create this A star nucleus, this compound nucleus that you wanna measure for, for the R process or for the I process, for example. However, because we're dealing with radioactive isotopes, this A minus one target nucleus is prone to decay. The neutron itself is also not feasible at this time uh, as a target. And so we can't really do this sort of direct measurement for a radioactive isotope. So instead we have to turn towards indirect techniques that will allow us to access this same A star compound nucleus, but through a different pathway. And so this kind, kind of indirect technique allows us to actually utilize the fact that there are short half-lives and sort of utilize the fact that we can create radio, radioactive beams. And so there, there are a couple of examples that I've shown here, but today I'll mostly talk about the beta Oslo method and the surrogate reaction method, um, which I have uh, the most experience with these two. Um, but within each of these different indirect neutron capture techniques, they all sort of rely on the same uh, theory work, which is Hauser-Feshbach theory for neutron capture. And so within Hauser-Feshbach theory, says that the neutron capture into your, your sort of statistical region for your compound nucleus, that cross-section for that reaction is proportional to three main quantities. The nuclear level density, which is the number of levels per MeV. So like the first order, you can kind of think of it just like counting um, until you get up to the statistical region and then nobody wants to count that high. And so we, we rely on these statistical techniques instead. The second component is the gamma ray strength function, which is the probability for a gamma ray to be emitted from a particular level uh, within your nucleus. And lastly, the optical model potential that describes the coupling between the neutron and then the target um, nucleus that you're uh, using. So this example is looking at strontium-95 in gamma, which is actually fairly close to stability. And if you run a Hauser-Feshbach code like TALIS, 
There are a lot of different models available for the level density, the strength function, and the optical model. So we wanted to see what is the uncertainty induced on the cross-section by these different available level density models as a first step. And so you can see that there's this sort of band of uncertainty associated with the level density. We can do the same thing for the available gamma ray strength function models. You can see that it's more uncertain in this case. The optical model potential for this strontium-95 reaction, which is fairly close to stability, is pretty well constrained, and so it doesn't contribute as much. But when you combine all three pieces of information and calculate your neutron capture cross-section, you end up with an almost, uh, uh, almost an order of magnitude uncertainty. Uh, and this, this reaction is actually fairly close to stability, and so you can imagine that this would get worse as you go towards these more exotic isotopes. And if you put this in the context of maybe the thousands of nuclei involved in, in an R process network, you can see how the, the uncertainties associated with these cross-sections would really limit our predictive capabilities uh, for the R process, the R process or the I process, and sort of really goes to say that we need to be able to measure these and, and constrain these a little bit better. And that's exactly what goes into studies like these ones. And so this one is for the R process, this is abundance versus mass number A. And so this sort of like larger band uh, that's this light green color. Um, oh, and so sorry, these are R process residuals that are shown here. And so you can kind of think of these like the abundance plots that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so if we have, for example, you know, an order of magnitude uncertainty, you have something that looks more like this sort of like light green band. But if we're able to uh, constrain the overall uncertainty down to like a factor of two, then you can see that this dark green band, which is represented by that, actually follows better the structure of this abundance. And so that gives us more sensitivity to be predictive and to better understand and model uh, the R process. The same type of thing can be done for the I process, and this was done by the new grid group um, a couple years ago. And so this is a snippet of the chart of the nuclides from cobalt up to technetium. And this maximum variation factor is basically the same thing that I just showed you, where you get that order of magnitude uncertainty. So the cross sections uh, within hauser feschbach are calculated for all of these different nuclei. And you can see this maximum variation factor being red means that they're very uncertain. And so I like to think of these sort of things almost like the fuel that we need <laughs> in nuclear science to go out and start to measure some of these, these quantities. So we know we have to use indirect techniques to get the neutron capture cross-sections that we're interested in. And so we could, <clears throat> in principle, use uh, reaction-based techniques where we would have uh, like a DP reaction, um, helium-3, helium-3, PT, P helium-4, and so on. And so there are a lot of different types of different reactions that you can use to populate this nucleus that you want to measure. Or instead, we could use beta decay to populate the, the nucleus. Um, and so we have sort of two options or many options to be able to do this. Um, and uh, that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of this presentation is the beta Oslo method, a little bit about the inverse Oslo method and the surrogate reaction method and how they can all be applied to constrain neutron capture reaction rates for astrophysical processes. And so I'll start with the beta Oslo method. <clears throat> and so in this method, we wanna populate our compound nucleus uh, and we use beta decay to do that. And so uh, we can, with this technique, we can study nuclei very far from stability because the majority of things on the neutron rich side beta decay. Uh, this is feasible with low beam intensities on the order of like one particle per second. And so what we need for this method is a radioactive beam and a segmented gamma ray calorimeter. This is called the beta Oslo method. And so the Oslo part comes from the traditional <clears throat> Oslo method. So we have uh, Cecilia Larson and Magna Gutormsen at, at Oslo, University of Oslo. And the beta part comes from MSU, from Sean Liddick and Artemis Spiru. And so we're using beta decay to populate this compound nucleus and then extracting our neutron capture cross sections. Um, so just as an example, you would start with a radioactive beam of niobium-103, which would beta decay to molybdenum-103, allowing you to constrain then the molybdenum-102 neutron capture reaction. So um, let's just talk about this in a little bit more detail and how this method works. Um, so, okay, so we use uh, beta decay to populate our nucleus. The two things we experimentally need to measure are the excitation energy and the gamma ray energy. 
These quantities allow us to construct experimental matrices where we plot this excitation energy versus gamma ray energy. Uh, and from this matrix, we follow through Oslo analysis to unfold the matrix um, to account for the detector response, isolating primary gamma rays, the first gamma ray emitted from every uh, excitation energy bin. We can then extract the functional forms of the level density and strength function to which we have to apply external normalizations. Uh, the low-lying levels from the NNDC, so this is previously measured data, the level density at the neutron separation energy or uh, using theory, and then the average radiative width or giant dipole resonance data extrapolation. That then allows us to calculate our semi-experimental neutron capture cross-section like the one that's shown here. And so this band, this sort of like lighter green band is what you would get by doing all combinations of level density and strength function and talus versus the semi-experimental one uh, that's shown in the darker green uh, following through this method. And so this was a very quick overview, but I'm going to talk about each of these different steps um, in more detail throughout the next couple of slides. So the segmented gamma ray calorimeter that we use in this case is SUN. SUN is the summing sodium iodide detector. It's a large size, high efficiency gamma ray detector uh, composed of sodium iodide, where uh, it's segmented into eight different segments. And so a segment corresponds to these three PMTs that I'm highlighting with my mouse. So we have eight segments in total. Looking at it at an individual segment of SUN allows you to have access to information about individual gamma rays. And then summing across the entire detector volume gives you access to the total excitation energy, which if you remember, these are the two pieces I said that we need for uh, beta Oslo type studies. And so as an example, cobalt 60 uh, will beta decay and emit two characteristic gamma rays. So in one segment of sun, um, you can see the two different gamma rays that de-excite from, from this level. And then in the total absorption spectrum or the sum across the entire detector volume, you get access to this entry state or this, this level energy, which is the sum of these two gamma rays. So now that we have both of these pieces of information, we can actually proceed through the uh, Oslo analysis. But first, let's talk about um, how we actually do these, these experiments. And so uh, there are a couple of different uh, flavors, I guess you could say, of, of beta Oslo type measurements. You could do a beta Oslo measurement with fast beams. And so a fast beam is something that's moving, for example, at like 50% the, the speed of light. And so these have already been delivered in the past from the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory um, into Sun for, for many experimental campaigns and will also be used at, at EFRIB in the future. Uh, with SUN and other total absorption spectrometers like MTAS. So the beam would come down and first pass through a couple of silicon pin detectors where we can get particle ID. Uh, it'll then stop in a double-sided strip detector that's pictured here. This is segmented with uh, 16 horizontal and 16 vertical strips that allow you to create pixels um, so that you can correlate the, the implanted beam ions with their subsequent decay for these beta decay studies. And then of course our gamma rays are detected in SUN. We can also do stopped beam studies. Um, these have also been performed uh, at Argonne National Laboratory where we have an ongoing campaign. And so in this case, uh, we have very low energy beams um, and we utilize a tape station like the one that's pictured here. This is called Suntan. Um, and instead of using this double-sided strip detector for the beta detector, uh, for getting that sort of like beta coincidence, we instead utilize a tape system where the beam comes in and plants on the tape and then moves out of the way. Um, after a certain amount of time that's related to the half-life. And so this allows us to remove long-lived contaminants. And so these are the two types of, of studies that uh, we've done with, beta, with the beta Oslo method uh, thus far. And uh, I wanna walk through very quickly how the Oslo analysis works, because I know that a lot of times this seems like a little bit of a black box if you haven't done the Oslo analysis. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. And so here I'm showing uh, beta Oslo measurement for the decay, the beta decay of scandium 51 to titanium 51. And this uh, matrix is our raw matrix. It's purely experimental, plotting excitation energy on the y axis and gamma ray energy on the x axis. From this, you can also investigate nuclear structure by doing total absorption spectroscopy. Um, you can make things like decay schemes or, or calculate beta decay feedings. But once we have this matrix, we then go to the next step, which is unfolding the matrix. And so this is the unfolded matrix for this same beta decay. Uh, unfolding means that we want to understand the detector response 
of sun with respect to this, this matrix. And so we need to account for the interaction of all of the different gamma rays in the detector. So we generate a response function for sun and j out 4 and then use an iterative procedure to determine the incoming energy of the different gamma rays. And so this allows us to then understand the detector response and sort of remove that from the matrix. After this step, we then want to isolate primary gamma rays. That's the first gamma ray emitted from each excited state. So this is also done through an iterative subtraction, uh, iterative procedure where we subtract contributions of the, the low energy, or sorry, subtract uh, contributions of gamma rays from lower excited states from the higher excited states. And so these are only the first gamma ray emitted in every cascade. This is also sometimes called the first generation matrix. And it's this uh, um, matrix P, which is proportional to our level density and to our gamma ray strength function. And so this is a functional form. And so I guess step four of this, which I won't talk about at this point, but will in a couple of slides, is that we need to then normalize this um, so that it's not a functional form anymore. So let's talk about validating this method. Um, does it work? Um, uh, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. <laughs> but uh, you've already seen these two matrices for the raw uh, for Scandium 51 beta decay and then the primary, because I just talked about those. But in order to validate this, we also wanted to compare it to a DP measurement. And so we have our Scandium 51 beta decay to titanium 51 for the beta Oslo part. And then uh, comparing this to Oslo analysis, uh, there was also a titanium 50 DP measurement that was done at the Oslo Cyclotron Laboratory. So we wanted to compare these two to see if they get similar results. And so you can sort of note the differences between uh, the raw experimental matrices between these two different reaction mechanisms um, and the primary matrices as well. But when we proceed through the Oslo analysis, we can extract the level density, which is shown here. So this is plotting level density versus excitation energy. And uh, the DP measurement uh, that was done at the Oslo Cyclotron Lab is shown in these sort of like cyan or teal, maybe <laughs> colored points, along with the associated uncertainty band uh, shown in the same color. And then the, the results from the beta Oslo measurement are shown in the green uh, diamonds. And so you can see that these actually agree quite nicely with each other. Uh, one important thing to notice here is that this histogrammed region that's shown at the bottom, this is one of our normalization points that we use. So these are the known levels that are coming from, from previous measurements from the NNDC. And so you can see that we have to use different known levels for beta decay, which is shown in the dot, uh, the dashed line uh, versus the DP measurement, which is shown in the solid line. And this is because beta decay is, is a more selective uh, process. And so we only use allowed beta decay plus a dipole transition. So that's one of our normalization points um, that allows us to fix the, the slope of this level density. And then we also uh, also normalize at the, the higher energies close to the neutron separation energy, typically using theory calculations. The gamma ray strength function is a similar story. So this is gamma ray strength versus gamma ray energy. The data points that are up here are coming from the giant dipole resonance. And so we, we sort of extrapolate from this to fix the overall magnitude of the, the strength function with where it lies along the y-axis. But you can see that the DP and uh, the beta Oslo um, extracted strength functions are also in very good agreement, which is awesome. And so then at this point, we can then calculate our neutron capture cross-section for titanium-51 using both the DP and the beta Oslo. And you can see that they agree quite well. And this is a significant reduction from uh, the uncertainties that you get in TALIS, which is this the gray band versus the blue. And so um, the answer is yes, this does work. And so now let's talk about normalizations. So I know for a lot of people, this uh, can be a sticking point because we do need to normalize with, uh, with other forms of data to do this method. Um, so when we extract a little bit of the same strength function, like I said, we get a functional form. And so one normalization point that we require at these low energies is known levels from the NNDC. And so the NNDC is the National Nuclear Data Center, just in case uh, I don't want to use any acronyms that people don't uh, or aren't familiar with. So we normalize at the low energies using known data. And then at the higher energies, uh, you want to normalize with the neutron uh, resonance spacing, D0. However, for radioactive nuclei, these haven't been measured. So instead, we utilize theory calculations uh, from different models. And so in this example, for copper 74, um, beta decay to zinc 74, 
uh, we're using Hartree Fackel Belief calculations from Stefan Borelli and collaborators. And this is how we normalize the level density at the, um, at the neutron separation energy. For the gamma ray strength function, the normalizations that we typically use um, are our uh, extrapolations from giant dipole resonance data. So this is gamma n measurements. And so you can see in this work, the beta Oslo data points are in the black, uh, along with the associated green uncertainty band. And then these are three different data sets of gamma n data or GD, GDR data that are then extrapolated down to the gamma ray strength function to sort of fix the overall uh, normalization. And so you can sort of see um, the uncertainty that would be sort of induced by um, using the extrapolation of the giant dipole resonance. And so this is sort of uh, the approach that we typically take towards normalizing. However, uh, there is some new work in progress um, uh, that allows us to normalize the data in a different way, where we can actually take the shape of the gamma ray strength function directly from the data without any external normalizations, and then use that to get a model independent level density. And so this sort of removes the need for this D0 and gamma gamma parameter. So this is called uh, on the Oslo and inverse Oslo side, the shape method. Um, and it's also a shape method for beta Oslo, but uh, the code is called shape it. And uh, you can read both of these uh, papers. Well, you can read the, the shape method paper uh, in PRC that was published last year and the shape it paper for the beta Oslo analysis was submitted to PRC as a letter and uh, hopefully will be accepted uh, soon. And so the way that this works is that we're looking instead um, at diagonals in our matrices. And so you can see these diagonals that are shown here for different two plus states. And this is for germanium 76. And so we're taking different excitation energy bins and looking at how the, the uh, intensity of these different two plus states from these diagonals changes. Um, and so you can see three different excitation energy bins. And these two plus states are coming directly from the continuum. And so we use the, the difference in intensity and we take a ratio to actually get uh, a gamma ray strength function. Um, and so if you look, this is showing another gamma ray strength function plot. The, the blue band that's shown here is from beta Oslo um, results by um, from, from the initial beta Oslo paper. The <clears throat> magenta are coming from a, a measurement at the Oslo cyclotron lab for germanium 74. And if you look at the data that's shown in the triangles, uh, this strength function is coming directly from the shape method analysis. And so we're able to actually get the overall normalization and shape of, of the gamma ray strength function without having to do any of these, these external normalizations that I was talking about. You can then take the shape of the strength function and apply it back towards the level density to get a model independent level density, which, which is what's shown here. The discrete levels, again, are shown here in the sort of histogrammed region in the light blue. The red data points are particle evaporation um, data that's taken that was taken at Ohio University. Um, and so this is a different way to get the, the level density. And then the level density from the shape method is shown here. And so you can see that these are in great agreement with each other, which is uh, really exciting because it gives us a way to perform um, this method without having to rely on any external normalizations. I wanna briefly talk about uh, another flavor of the Oslo method, the uh, inverse Oslo, uh, before talking about the surrogate reactions uh, in the next couple of slides. And so built on the traditional Oslo method, beta Oslo was developed, and now there's also the inverse Oslo method, uh, where you take the traditional Oslo method, but you do it in inverse kinematics instead. And so uh, one of the first measurements of this was nickel 64 PD. Uh, and so these are the raw, unfolded in first generation matrices for this reaction. Um, and this is the result for the nuclear level density again, compared to a, a particle evaporation type measurement um, done at Ohio University shown in the green. And then the data points from inverse Oslo are shown in, in black. And so you see that there's, there's quite a good agreement between the two. Um, for the string function, it's the same uh, sort of story where again, this, uh, these orange points are coming from extrapolation of the giant dipole resonance. And so this just sort of goes to show us that, that we can also do these Oslo type analyses uh, for things other than, than beta decay um, using PD or DP reactions, for example, um, and that you can get uh, results with these as well that will allow us to constrain neutron capture reactions. 
So um, now you've heard many, many things about uh, Oslo and beta Oslo. Um, and so now I want to talk about the other indirect technique um, that I wanted to mention throughout this talk, which is the surrogate reaction method, which is something that I've been working on for the past uh, couple of years here at Livermore. So in the surrogate reaction, instead of using beta decay to populate this compound nucleus, we would want to use a charged particle reaction like a DP reaction, or you could do helium-3, helium-3, helium-4, helium-4, PP prime, you know, PD. So there are many flavors of the surrogate reaction method um, as well. And so for this technique, we populate our compound nucleus through one of these reactions. We're also able to study nuclei that are very far from stability, these radioactive isotopes. However, you do need higher beam intensities for these reaction style experiments. Uh, greater than 10 to the six particles per second would be amazing. Um, and so what you need for this technique, you need a radioactive beam. Uh, you also need uh, some sort of deuteron or, or proton target. Um, you need a segmented high resolution gamma ray array and you need a segmented charged particle array as well. And so these are a couple of the different ones that I'll, I'll briefly mention throughout the talk um, for different detector systems. And so let's talk about how this method actually works. We know we can't do this neutron capture into a radioactive strontium-93 nucleus directly because it's just not feasible. So, uh, but the way that we calculate that, just like what I was showing earlier with Hauser-Feschbach, uh, this is that formalism written out again, where your neutron capture cross-section uh, is equal to the probability for forming your compound nucleus, so our strontium-94 in this case, through an, a neutron capture reaction. And then this um, G is a, a decay probability where things like the nuclear level density and gamma ray shrink function and optical model get, get folded in. So since we can't do this directly, uh, uh, Uta Escher and, and collaborators developed this reaction formalism for DP, where instead we utilize a, a DP reaction uh, where we impinge our strontium-93 beam on, for example, a, a CD2 target, which contains our, our deuterium. Uh, we then would detect the outgoing protons and any gamma rays that come from the de-excitation of our strontium-94 nucleus. So this, this function P is called a coincidence probability. So it's relating detecting this proton in coincidence with a gamma ray to just detecting a proton. Um, and this is related to uh, two different pieces. So this piece is this same decay probability that you see goes into Hauser-Feschbach theory. And so these are how these are connected to each other. And then F is the probability for forming your compound nucleus through DP. And so this formalism was, was developed by Gregory Patel and collaborators and things like spin distributions, um, angular momentum distributions and so on are what go into that um, F function. Experimentally, what we actually measure are characteristic gamma rays um, that are de-exciting. And so uh, we compare the number of particle plus gamma coincidences uh, divided by just the number of, of particle events that you would get, so the number of just single proton events that you would get, and then you also have to include the detector efficiency. So this P is what we then provide to Yuda um, so that she can actually calculate and constrain G, this decay probability, um, extracting parameters for uh, the Hauser-Feschbach parameters for the level density and strength function that then get put into this calculation of the neutron capture cross-section. So this is an overview of this method. And so I just wanted to take a second to say maybe some differences between the, the two different techniques I've already discussed, which is that in like Oslo and Beta Oslo, we're more interested in this sort of continuum region. And so we typically only look uh, for the Oslo style analysis at regions that are above the discrete levels. Uh, and we wanna go up to the neutron separation energy. In, in the surrogate style analysis, instead, we're looking at discrete transitions at low energies that you know these, these gamma rays from the continuum are cascading through. And we use these discrete transitions at the low energies to sort of inform our information about uh, the separation energy or around the separation energy. And so these are sort of two different ways you can think of like how the analysis might work. Uh, there are a lot of different experimental setups for surrogate reactions, but I'll just highlight two of the, um, two of the ones that, that I've worked with. Um, and so there's Goddess, uh, which is uh, a collaboration with uh, Oak Ridge and Rutgers University, as well as Livermore. 
where you have the Aruba detector, which is a highly segmented silicon detector, which is shown here and also here in this little snippet. And so this covers almost uh, four pi um, and it allows you to get protons and deuterons, carbon and so on uh, at both um, angles greater than 90 degrees and less than 90 degrees in, in the laboratory frame. And so this is the, the charged particle array that you need to enable the particle gamma, gamma coincidences that you want for the surrogate analysis. Aruba in this case is then coupled to, in this photo, Bertina, uh, which is a highly segmented uh, gamma ray tracking array. It has a very high resolution as well. Um, or it could also be coupled to gamma sphere. And these are some of the places where these experiments have been run in the past. Uh, at Triumph, um, there's also uh, uh, an array that we can use for these surrogate type measurements. Um, called SHARK, which is another highly segmented silicon array that's located at the center of Tigris, which is a high purity germanium clover array. And so these are two different uh, types of experimental setups that we can use um, for surrogate reactions. So the first, uh, so we want to talk again about validation of the method, um, you know, asking the question, does it work? Um, and so the first measurement for, for surrogate reactions in DP uh, style measurements was done at Texas A&M using the setup that's shown here. And uh, it was from molybdenum 95 DP and it was a normal kinematics. And so these methods actually kind of have almost the same starting point in that we make an excitation energy versus gamma ray energy matrix. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. This one is shifted, or it's uh, the axes are flipped compared to what I showed earlier. But here on the x-axis, we have excitation energy, and on the y-axis, we have our gamma ray energy. <coughs> and this is our particle gamma matrix that we need for the, the surrogate analysis. And so this matrix will allow us to calculate our numerator, the number of particle gamma coincidences that we have. So. The neutron separation energy, again, is highlighted here. So let's talk a little bit about this matrix <clears throat> and uh, the different gamma ray lines that we see and what they mean. And so for the energies that are less than the separation energy, so sort of on this side, uh, this is where we have our Molly 95 DP reaction. And so this is creating our Molly 96 compound nucleus. And so all of the gamma ray lines that you see here should come from uh, or should be the gamma rays that you would expect in molybdenum 96. Above the neutron separation energy, however, the neutron channel opens up. And so from Molly 96, we get neutron emission to molybdenum 95. And so you can see the gamma rays that would be associated with, uh, with molybdenum 95 at energies greater than the separation energy. <coughs> Sorry, it's very dry here. <laughs> um, at energies that are greater than the, the separation energy. And so there's actually a lot of sort of fruitful information that you can also get from, from these DP measurements other than just the neutron capture that I'll be, I'll be talking about after this. And so uh, if you look at this in terms of the gamma rays, the blue in this case is, is for energies less than the separation energy, and the orange is for energies greater than the neutron separation energy. And so you can see that the gamma rays are in fact uh, quite different from each other. Um, but in the surrogate style analysis, we want to gate on, on a collecting transition. And so what this means is that all of the gamma rays that are cascading from the higher energies, we want to gate on a transition that sort of all of these gamma rays de-excite through. And so for an even-even nucleus, uh, typically the two to zero transition um, to the ground state is the one that you'd want to use. And you would gate on this particular gamma ray to calculate the number of particle gamma coincidences that you have. And that's your numerator for this particle gamma coincidence matrix that you construct. Um, you then calculate your number of proton singles events. You have to also incorporate in your gamma ray efficiency. And you're able to construct an experimental coincidence probability that looks like this, where for that two to zero transition uh, that I just mentioned, you can see that the coincidence probability is one because all of the gamma rays that are coming from the high lying states de-excite through that one transition, this two to zero. Uh, some other coincidence probabilities for different transitions are also shown here. They all have a very characteristic shape in that they all start to have this fall off around the neutron separation energy where the neutron channel opens up, um, which was what I showed in the spectrum 
where you have the neutron emission from molybdenum 96 back to the molybdenum 95. And so uh, this is exactly what we provide to UDA um, to do the theory calculations that are necessary for the surrogate reaction method. And so she would fit in this range uh, from about an MeV or so uh, below the separation energy and above. Um, and she uses all these different pieces of information in her sort of analysis to constrain things. And so we have measured the particle gamma coincidence matrix experimentally. Yuda then wants to calculate uh, this particle gamma um, particle gamma uh, matrix again, but but through theory in order to sort of uh, get this G that then gets used in our hauser feshbach theory. And so she does a Bayesian Monte Carlo analysis to minimize this, uh, the sort of like the differences between the experimental and the calculated so that she can then match the experimental coincidence probability that we have. She can extract the hauser feshbach parameters um, that are used to get this function G um, things like the level density and gamma ray strength function. And she can then uh, put these into the calculation for the neutron capture cross-section and end up with a neutron capture cross-section like this one, uh, where for molybdenum 95, where the Weisskopf Ewing approximation is shown um, in sort of above the data. And then the, the direct, a couple of direct measurements are shown in the orange and black points. And then the surrogate method uh, shown in the blue. And so you can see that this like agrees quite nicely with previous data and even with the evaluations that have been done by our nuclear data colleagues. So yes, this method does work. And something that uh, we're excited to see come out is work by Heather Garland, where she did the same reaction, but in inverse kinematics, just to see how these, how these things agree um, with each other and what this looks like. Um, you can also do the surrogate reaction method using PD reactions. It doesn't just have to be DP. And so, for example, if you wanted to, to constrain yttrium-87 and gamma, you could use a PD reaction on yttrium-89. And so these are some results for, for some PD reactions uh, for the surrogate reaction method as well. Um, the surrogate reaction method has been applied widely across the nuclear chart for different purposes. And so you can see some astrophysical measurements highlighted in the blue. Um, there's also a lot of exciting theory work, <coughs> excuse me, going on um, in this, in addition to sort of the experimental side. And so there's currently ongoing work to extend the, the reaction formalism to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, to inelastic scattering instead of the DP and PD. <clears throat> There's also plans to extract <clears throat> the nuclear level density and gamma ray strength function from the Bayesian Monte Carlo. Uh, and uh, there's also <clears throat> new work on optical model potentials by Cole Pruitt also at Livermore that will allow us to have uncertainty quantified uh, optical model potentials involved as well. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to give, uh, <clears throat> sorry, just give me one quick second, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I wanted to give one quick example about a nucleus where both there exists data on uh, surrogate reaction and beta oslo method, and that's for strontium-93 and, and gamma. So strontium-93 uh, plays an important role in, in the eye process for the production of zirconium and molybdenum. And it's also important for the more applied side. Um, past beta decay measurements for rubidium-94 actually showed that there was this strong gamma decay branch above the neutron separation energy, which was unexpected and would lead to an enhancement in the neutron capture cross-sections and reaction rates. And so we wanted to try to measure this. And so almost at the same time, we actually did a strontium-93 DP measurement at Triumph using the surrogate reaction method. And that's something that I am working on. And then at Argonne National Laboratory with Sun, we did the rubidium-94 uh, beta decay and that beta oslo analysis is underway by Adriana. And so this will provide a really interesting uh, comparison between the two different methods and also will provide some interesting astrophysical information as well. And so <clears throat> this, is, this is really exciting, uh, I think, so that we can finally sort of like compare the two methods and see where they overlap and, and how they sort of like work together. Um, 
And so today we've talked about how neutron capture constraints are vital for our understanding of nucleosynthesis, but how direct measurements are feasible. And so we have to use these indirect techniques like the beta Oslo method, inverse Oslo, and the surrogate reaction method to try to constrain these. And these constraints at, at Efrib, at Argon, and Triumph, and so on, paved the way for new scientific discoveries. So for future plans, I think it would be really interesting if we could perform uh, all of these different techniques on the same nucleus to try to compare them. So for both beta Oslo, inverse Oslo, and surrogate reaction method, and sort of the, then check their complementarity and, and understand where, you know, in the different regions of the chart of the nuclei, we can apply these techniques um, to best utilize all of the tools that we have available. And so I just wanted to leave you sort of on this more uh, like, I think happy note um, that the future is really bright for indirect techniques. And so this um, chart is showing projected effort beam rates uh, with the 400 MeV per U upgrade. And so you can see that, you know, with charge exchange reactions like T helium three, surrogate reactions that I've talked about, inverse kinematics Oslo and beta Oslo, we're able to have a vastly expanded experimental reach. And if we can all work together to measure reactions in, in different regions of the nuclear chart, I think that we can finally reach this, this uh, you know, better understanding of our process nucleosynthesis and I process nucleosynthesis um, and how these neutron capture techniques really contribute to these different processes. And so with that, I would like to thank all of the uh, awesome institutions and collaborators who, who are involved in this work. Um, special thank you to these people for, for slides and slide suggestions. And of course, thank you to all of you for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much for that great talk, Andrea. Um, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand on Zoom or you can put them in the chat. Um, you can message me directly if you want to be anonymous for any reason. 